Okay, um, we're doing the first one, the Mevrovingian looped fibula. Um, it should be actually fibulae because a fibula just means a pin and there are two of them, so it should be fibulae, but fibula is fine. Um, this is a work of, um, uh, from more north in Europe, actually this was found just outside of Paris. I know that most of what we've been dealing with has been in Italy and in Greece, but we're moving a little bit north here. Um, we'll talk about why in just a bit. Okay, so you can see it's made from very precious materials, uh, so it's silver with inlays of garnets. So we can see the garnets here, right? So this is obviously a prestige object. Um, it was uh, obviously, you know, it's very beautiful, very richly adorned. It was found in the grave of a woman, um, like I said, north of Paris. Um, another point that you would use to prove that this is a prestige object is that obviously this took a lot of labor to create and I'll talk about some of the de uh, some of the techniques used in that. Um, so as, like as I said a fibula is a pin or a brooch used to fasten garments right um, and lots of different styles of fibula they were made popular actually by the Romans I'll talk about that just in in just a moment. So we're just essentially talking about a decorative pin and it, it works pretty much exactly like a safety pin does. We don't see the back of it, but there's you know a, a sharp pin and a fastener for that. Um, so this particular fib or these particular fibula were named for the founder of the Mevro Mevro Mevrovingian line um, who ruled a large part of France. So that makes sense as these were found um, outside of Paris. Um, so we're going to refer to uh, these people, uh, the Merovingians and other people who use these fibula um, as barbarians. I'm not talking about the Romans, but I'm talking about the barbarians. And when I say barbarians, that has obviously a very negative connotation. But in this context, we really only mean somebody who is non-Roman, um, illiterate and nomadic, um, which, uh, you know, the illiterate part doesn't sound so great. Right. Um, but we're not I'm not using the term pejoratively. So these were made popular by Roman military campaigns. Um, we can see the Romans would wear, uh, the Roman soldiers and uh, would wear things very similar to these. Uh, and that inspired the people that they were conquering to create them as well. Um, they are most commonly found, however, in uh, the grave sites of the barbarians, which is why they're so important, because we don't really have a lot of you know, written records about the barbarians because they did not write. Uh, and so that's why these pins are so valuable to our understanding of them. Um, so there's a term that you need to know in with respect to how these things are made. It's cloisonne, C-L-O-I-S-O-N-N-E, cloisonne, right? And cloisonne is a... Um, a technique wherein wire, a very thin, very thin pieces of wire are soldered onto the back of, or, or soldered rather, or soldered onto metal, so attached to a flat piece of metal. And so you see these thin pieces of wire are attached in different shapes, right? If you look at my my mouse, right? Um, and in within those different shapes are then placed um, um, either enamel or inlaid pieces of stone. So essentially the cloisonne is a technique to decorate uh, metal, all right? Um, so uh, oh, so enamel or stone or semi-precious stone is used um, in the middle of the wire patterns. Um, another uh, decorative or visual technique that's used here is what we call um, oh, actually, I just have a couple of images of different fibula or fibulae. So there's one that's very plain, right? We see one with two eagles. Um, I'll talk about eagles in just a moment because there are eagles on ours as well. But you also notice that in Justinian um, mosaic, there is a fibula used uh, connecting his garment there. So, and in fact, this fibula or you know, the Justinian mosaic from San Vitale would have been made around the same time as our uh, fibula that we're looking at. All right, so very popular pieces. So, um, uh, so other visual elements here, we have what we call zoomorphic elements, zoomorphic elements. So essentially um, shapes of animals. So what do we see? Well, first of all, you see fish, you see two little fish here, and here's what I'm talking about, the cloisonne technique. So the, sh the outline of the fish and the scales are made with wires and inside are in, are in 
the, the different colors of the scales uh, inside the fish are created with, um, I believe this is with enamel, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, so fish, uh, and we also have a repeated pattern of an eagle head. So it's, it's somewhat stylized, but you can see there's the beak and there's the eye and it repeats here and it repeats here and here and here and here, right? So, um, so what we'd say about, especially the eagle head, is that it's so integrated into the form of the pin that we uh, may not even notice it at first. Uh, eagles were uh, symbols, uh, very popular during the Imperial Roman period when they were out marching and getting these territories from the barbarians. Um, uh, eagle would have been associated with the sun. Um, later on, eagles become associated with uh, St. John, but you don't really need to know that. Um, right, okay. Uh, so another visual aspect of this piece is what we call um, the, both the interlacing and the horror vacui. I'll talk about horror vacui first. Horror vacui means horror of empty space. So you'll notice when we look at our piece here that there's no spot that's not filled with decoration. And this is a technique that's very common in Hiberno-Saxon art. And I'll talk about who the Hiberno-Saxons were um, a little bit later when we look at Lindisfarne Gospels, but that, that will apply. Um, so every single millimeter is filled with some kind of, uh, you know, um, patterning or detail or decoration. Uh, and same for this other piece. So horror vacui, um, horror of empty space or fear of empty space. And so we fill all our spaces with visual um, information, you know, to, to delight the eye. Um, so uh, here are a couple of other examples. And when we get into um, Islamic art, which we will today, when we look at the Great Mosque of Cordoba, um, this will obviously factor in as well. So it's really quite um, quite intoxicating. It's, uh, it really does uh, draw your eye in and mesmerizing and hypnotizing, I would say. You really, it's hard to look away if you really get into it. Okay, um, yeah, so her, her back to back. And I didn't mention interlacing. Uh, I thought I had a slide on that, I don't. So you'll notice, um, you can definitely see it in this. Um, uh, this is actually a belt buckle. Uh, but you'll notice we have this kind of knot, this, this knotting pattern, right? Which might remind some of you of like Celtic knots, things that you associate with Ireland or Scotland, and in fact, that's the case. Um, so this interlacing pattern is also extremely popular in the, the fibula that we find in Barbarian Graves. It's not so strong in this piece. We can kind of see it on the outside. It's not as clear an interlacing, but if you follow my mouse here, you can see it in the silver part. Um, but interlacing is, is going to be a, a very big part of the fibula, and it's also going to factor into the Lindisfarne Gospels, which we will do next. Okay, fibula, pins. Um, barbarians got them from the Romans, zoomorphic elements, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks very much.